Hey guys, this is Timmy. I'm going to do Psalm 23. This is the 23rd it's Saturday. And it's hot early, so I'll get on with it. And um, we'll do the proverb, and then we'll do the devotional, and then prayer. So, and thanks everybody for sticking with it. And I appreciate you guys uh, more than you know. So, I'm going to try and catch up on comments later today or tomorrow. So, I'm about three or four days behind on that. But so uh, I'm not ignoring anybody. I just it's been busy the last couple days. So, Whew. verse twenty th or chapter twenty three, verse one says, "When you sit to eat with the ruler, consider diligently what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite." So I mean that's it goes on with a little more context. But if uh, think about the king's table would have the choicest of meats and vegetables and fruit and desserts and all that stuff so consider diligently what's before you or choose wisely or you can make this real simple and like in America we have lots of all you can eat buffets well if you choose unwisely as you're making your choices you're gonna eat less you might not get a chance to try as much of everything if you're gonna load up on a particular item so when you have options choose wisely that's a real simple way to put it uh, if you're given over to appetites, it's better to go ahead and just kill yourself. And that's a little extreme on the analogy, but I think I'll get the point. Verse 3 says, Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich, and cease from your own wisdom. You know, keep your common sense, and don't do stupid things just to get more money. Um, will you set your eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Um, pipe dreams. You know, you've got these bright ideas, and if you go chasing after every idea that you have, you might end up being like a dog chasing your own tail. So don't give your wisdom away, or don't cease in what you know better than. Um, keep your common sense and your wits about you, and don't go chasing the riches. Uh, there's a difference between setting a goal and achieving a goal or to be running after something you know you'll never catch. Uh, if you're given over to appetites, rather it be any appetite of the flesh, if you're around opportunity to fulfill those desires, coveting can lead to those things. So in this example, it's uh, eating with a king or a ruler. Same difference. Uh, so verse 6 says, Eat you not the bread of him that has an evil eye, neither desire you his dainty meats. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, says he to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel which uh, you have eaten shall you vomit up and lose the sweet words. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. And remove not the old landmark, and enter into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty, and he shall plead their cause with you. Apply your heart unto instruction, and your ears to the words of knowledge. Okay, so we've talked about giving gifts or receiving gifts. Be careful about it. When you get a gift from somebody, if it's not a true gift, it'll be a leverage that they're using against you. The borrower is enslaved to the lender. That's what we found, I think, yesterday. And so, if it's a gift, a gift is something you give, okay? And when you give a gift, it's no longer yours, it's gone away from you. So if I were to buy somebody something and I give it to them, I can't come back and be like, well, I got you this, so you need to get me that. That's not a gift, that's a lever. That's leverage that you're trying to manipulate somebody with. Um, bribes, you know, if I gave you this just to get you to act right, eventually... You're not going to act right unless you get the bribe to go with it. Uh, I've seen it with my dog. I've seen it with kids. So you have to be careful about gift giving and receiving. So find out where their heart is. Where's the motivation behind the gift. Um, okay, so it says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if you beat him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Okay, it's not saying beat your children. So let's not take this scripture out of context. 
this isn't advocating child abuse but this is saying if you don't correct your children diligently then they could be bound for hell the correction that you can give a child in their formative years will last a lifetime I got spankings when I was a kid and my biggest problem was not wanting to disappoint my parents I wasn't afraid to get spanked again I was afraid to disappoint my parents to the degree to where they had to spank me and you always hear that it's gonna hurt me more than it hurts you well as a parent who's had to spank a child it does actually hurt the person spanking more than it hurts the buttock of the kid so during those formative years of correction don't withhold correction from the from the kid don't just appease the children so you don't have to go through a battle or a struggle go through those struggles because that could last a lifetime that correction if you skip it that could last a lifetime also in the wrong direction verse 15 says my son in your heart be wise my heart shall rejoice even mine yes my reins shall rejoice when they lip, when your lips speak right things let not your heart envy sinners be you in the fear of the Lord all the day long to fear the Lord is to hate evil so be hating evil all day long and don't look at the evil people prosper and desire their prosperity their their riches their lack of accountability for their own uh, behaviors don't don't feel that way because God will get in due time in God's timetable he'll get them back um, so yeah, let not your heart envy sinners be you in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and your expectation shall not be cut off. Hear you, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Be not amongst wine-bibbers, amongst riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Okay, this is given over to the appetites again. Rather it be for strong drink or um, gluttony is overindulgence of anything, usually in regard to food, but all things in moderation. This is saying that the drunkard and the glutton will both come to poverty because they're users and they use it all up. They don't plan ahead. They don't think about tomorrow. They just want to get high or drunk tonight. They just want to eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we might dine in hell. You only live once, right? Um, so don't hang out with those people if you can avoid it. Or you might go down with them. Hearken unto your father that begat thee, and despise not your mother when she is old. Now listen to your parents, even when they're getting old. <laughs> uh, verse 23, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Okay, so... Buy the truth, sell it not. To me, that may that makes sense in the sense to where knowledge and wisdom is sold these days. And so it's been sold since back in Solomon's days, apparently. But buy the truth, okay? However you have to acquire truth, buy it. And once you have it, receive it, and don't sell it. Give it away for free. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Okay, help people get an understanding that's better than the one they have. Help instruct people in how to be filling up with knowledge and godly wisdom. Show people how to be wise by leading by example. And in all of those things, buy the truth and sell it not. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begets a wise child shall have joy in him. Your mother and your father shall be glad, and she that bear these shall rejoice. Or she that bear thee, or you. She that bears you will rejoice. Um, righteous and greatly begets a wise child. So, he'll greatly rejoice if, the, if it's a good child. And the good child will get wisdom faster than a foolish child, obviously. Uh, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lies in wait. As for a prey and increases the transgressors among men okay behind every great man's a great woman okay that's cliche oh behind every sinning man there might be a sinful woman that can help uh, increase his transgressions uh, a woman should be a help mate for a man 
and a man should be a good leader for the woman and they both work in conjunction together to make a completed whole they come unified in the covenant of marriage as one voice to God so um, that's why they become one flesh it isn't just because of sex but they twain together which is almost like weaving you weave together this thread going one direction which is male and you weave together this thread which is the opposite direction of female and together they're knitted to make a fabric the, that one fabric is what God sees when you're unified now you also have blood covenant when you have sex out of marriage and uh, that's a covenant you're making between the two people as one flesh it's just not sanctified by God I'm guilty of that myself so those are things that need to be addressed and taken to God and asked for forgiveness and repented of and that's a tough one and in this day and age that's a tough one so my transgressions were increased and I've had some females act as if they were lying in wait for a prey um, men can be foolish when they're either thinking with the wrong portions or if they uh, have intentions that are not good or godly it's easy to, to give over to those desires um, verse 29 says who has woe who has sorrow who has contentions who has babbling who has wounds without cause they that tarry long at the wine and they that go seek mixed wine or mixed drinks right Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes shall behold strange woman, and your heart shall utter perverse things. Yes, you shall be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lies upon the top of a mast, which is like the main bulk. That holds the sail up on sail um, ships that use sails they have stricken me shalt thou say and I was not sick um, they have beaten me and I felt it not when shall I awake I will seek it yet again okay so this is talking about being drunk like wasted drunk but when when you start to get too much drink in you it, at the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder Okay, you might feel fine now, it might take an hour for that alcohol to process, and in an hour you might forget your own name. Um, and everybody's heard of beer goggles, you know, you start drinking and you'll see that girl or that guy and you'll think they're the hottest thing that's ever walked the earth. You wake up the next morning and after you've already uttered perversions of your heart, but that next morning when you wake up and you're a little more sober than you were the night before, you might wonder, what, what's going on? <laughs> what was I thinking? What were they thinking? The problem is, is you probably weren't thinking. Um, yea, though, sh or you shall be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lies upon a mast. You're just lying down in the wrong place, man. Uh, or woman. Uh, they have stricken me, shall you say, and I was not sick. I say, oh, I didn't have too much to drink last night, but somebody got over on me. Well, they beat me and I felt it not. Okay, we all know a lot of people who, when they're drunk, excuse me, they can get into a car wreck and be fine. They can kill the other person, but if they hadn't been drinking, they wouldn't have made it. I've seen drunk people get beat up to the point where they should be unconscious and they're still going. You could wonder if it's demonic. Uh, I think that's a legitimate question. Um, sometimes, when blackouts and stuff like that. Uh, when shall I awake? Alright, so he hasn't even gone to sleep yet, and he's already wondering when he's going to wake up so he can go do it again. That's it. That's 23. A lot of wisdom in there. Don't drink and drive, guys. And if you're going to drink, drink in moderation. And don't get wasted. That's what I would say. That's what the Bible says. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so the morning devotional for... Uh, somebody asked again, this is daily readings by C.H. Spurgeon, evening and morning. Uh, the ISBN number, if you want to get this exact one, is 978184550183918. 
if you type that number in you can find it anywhere I would say get the cheapest one you can get um, but it's really nice and it's cool and you can actually look it up and there's a free PDF if you want to get it for free I think it's Charles Spurgeon or chspurgeon.org or something like that but uh, you can find this daily devotional for free online or if you want to get a paperback or a legitimate copy you can get one I think they're about $19.99 or something on Amazon for the one I have it was a gift from me for from a lady in AA when I was on parole I had to go to AA twice a week not the biggest fan of the program but today alcohol seems to be a theme and um, you know there's only one step out of all the steps I don't really 100% support they call it a higher power it can be anything I call it Jesus Christ you know I used every opportunity at that place to talk about my higher power by name specific some people didn't like that but oh well uh, but the, I've seen the program works for a lot of people so I'm not I'm the one that demonizes the program I've seen a lot of people that need it so God will use elements places belief structures and stuff to get you moving in the right direction and when the spirit's time to lead you out or to a better higher place um, you know if you follow the spirit it might take a non-believer to places that are middle grounds that aren't completely 100 percent good and godly but that are a closer lily pad like if we're all on the water uh, you might lily pad till you get to solid ground God can use whatever tools are at his disposal to bring about his will. So that's what I would say. That's the sovereignty of God. Is he Even he can use ungodly things to bring people to himself along the way. Nobody's, nobody's going to be brought to God except for um, those that God chooses. And he can do whatever he wants. So That's why I have a problem with a lot of people that say King James only. I've seen a lot of people get saved from a New International Reader's Version, which you could probably be a first grader and read that book. But there's a lot of, I met a lot of illiterate people that can't read at all. And uh, that book helped bring people to the Lord because God's truth is in it. Now, did man try to change it? Yes. Is it what I would recommend? No. But can it work? Yes. <laughs> can God do whatever He wants? Yes. So trust in the Lord and all the rest will be made right. Uh, Obadiah chapter 1 verse 11 says even you was as one of them or even you were as one of them even thou wast as one of them okay so modern English is even you were as one of them uh, Mr. Spurgeon says brotherly kindness was due from Edom to Israel in the time of need but instead thereof the men of Esau now Esau is Edom if you didn't know that Esau was his name I think it means red one or hairy one I think Esau means hairy and Edom means red but um, it says God hated Edom or Esau either way I just I could be wrong on my scripture reference but uh, Esau is Jacob's twin Jacob turns to Israel Esau turns to Edom that's what God said so um, I just wanted to point that out so brotherly kindness was due from Edom to Israel in the time of need but instead thereof the men of Esau made common cause with Israel's foes special stress in the sentence before us is laid upon the word thou as when Caesar cried to Brutus and thou Brutus a bad action may be all the worse because of the person who has committed it when we sin, who are the chosen favorites of heaven, we sin with an emphasis. Ours is a crying offense because we are so peculiarly indulged. If an angel should lay his hand upon us when we are doing evil, he need not use any other rebuke than the question, uh, What you, what does, what, what are you doing here, basically? What dost thou here? Much forgiven, much delivered, much instructed, much enriched, much blessed, shall we dare to put forth our hand unto evil? God forbid. A few minutes of confession may be beneficial to you, gentle reader, this morning. Have you never laughed at uncleanness 
and the joke was not altogether offensive to your ear, even you were as one of them. When hard things were spoken concerning the ways of God, you, wa you were bashfully silent, and so to onlookers you were as one of them. When wordlings uh, were bartering in the market and driving hard bargains, were you not as one of them? When they were pursuing vanity with a hunter's foot, were you not as greedy for gain as they were? Could any difference be discerned between you and them? Is there any difference? Here we come to close quarters and be honest with your own soul and make sure that you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. But when this is sure, walk jealously, lest any should again be able to say, even you were as one of them. You would not desire to share their eternal doom when they be like them here. Or why then be like them here? Come not you into their secret, lest you come into their ruin. Side with the afflicted people of God, not with the world. Whew. Okay, so... In the Proverbs, we talked quite a bit about the ways of the world and the drunkard and, and those things. In my life experience, having got the DWI and gone to prison, um, you know, I was never much of a drinker. I was more of a smoker. So it was odd that the few times that I did drink and drive and got caught and got in big trouble. I know people that drink all day, every day almost or have in my past and it was really unfair life's not fair but it was unfair that these people could do it every day and get away with it and a handful of times I get caught um, you know that's being a friend of the world and some people are more friendly than others when it comes to the world and the ways to be so I can't look in any kind of discontent that how come I got caught and they didn't you know, I'm held to a higher standard than they were apparently. So I can't sit here and get mad at God or my friends. All I can do is be accountable for myself. And so, yeah, drinking got me into a lot of trouble. And I could tell other people, hey, don't drink, don't get yourself into trouble. But ultimately, it's going to be them that has to make that choice. Uh, but I don't have to sit there and encourage it. And so if you want to be a friend of the world, we're in the world, but we're not of it. And you're only as good as the company you keep. So... I always hear the argument, well, Jesus hung around with the sinners and all that. Well, yeah, but those sinners turned away from their sins and followed him. That's a little different than going to the bar three times, four times a week and saying, oh, well, you know, that's just me being my Jesus hanging out with the sinners. Um, that's not really how it works, right? So there's a balance to be had of if you're not going to be wanting to take part in their punishment, then why take part in what's going to bring about their punishment? And if you're not using the opportunity, if you're, if you're being silent when you should be speaking up, are you condoning that behavior? Or are you doing a disservice to Christ by not at least telling them? I'm probably the most unpopular friend of my groups of friends uh, because I'm the guy that always ruins the good time, right? We go out to the club or to the bar and I might have a couple drinks or something, but when it starts to go to the point to where it's not good and it's not moderate, you know, I have a tendency to either stop or drink more. Uh, or even when I'm drinking more, I might be feeling guilty about it. And uh, Or the nights when everyone else is drinking and I'm choosing not to drink at all. You know, maybe I don't have money or maybe I just don't feel like drinking. But it, that seems to be the thing to do uh, for uh, over... I don't know, once you turn 21, it's all about the drinking. So I had a lot of friends that that's what they do. They just... They work at a club or they are the DJ at the club or they drinking comes hand in hand with everything I know a lot of people can't even watch football on Sundays without drinking a lot so drinking can be a big problem obviously for some people more than others but it can also be an addiction it could be a door that opens if you want to self medicate you know are you putting the medication of self application in front of God's um, solving properties how can god solve a problem if we're too busy medicating ourselves from dealing with it you know so that's it um don't be 
you'll be considered as one of them if you're going to be with them. If you're going to be with them, at least make yourself separate and set apart in your behavior and your actions. I always go back to Daniel. When Daniel was with um, Nebuchadnezzar and all those guys, him and his buddies, they had to uh, maintain the standard that they had on themselves was diet. And he had to talk his way into getting their diet not straight from the king's table the choice meats and dainties and everything just like we talked about earlier so daniel was a fit model of how to do god's thing in the in right in the middle of everybody else doing their own and yeah they made fun of him at first or yeah it was a big joke at first until god came through and then everyone was like maybe wondering what is this daniel doing that i'm not um, <laughs> and he kept getting promoted to high status over and over so if you see success, follow what's successful, you know? If you see something that's not successful, especially in your spiritual walk or life, don't follow. Real simple, follow the Good Shepherd's voice. And with that, I'll pray. And uh, yeah, this has been a good one, so. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift your name on high, and we thank you for the opportunity to come together with your wisdom. Uh, thank you for revealing to us the truth that's in your word. We also thank you for Mr. Spurgeon and his teachings and his ability to break it down. Um, I just am very thankful for the devotionals and the opportunity to exercise my commitment to you, God. And I thank you for everybody who's able to agree um, or two or more gathered, you're in the midst. So every, every recording is uh, an experience with you, Father, and with um, Jesus in my heart and with the body of Christ that's also participating. So thank you for all the comments, God. Thank you for spreading your word across the world. I uh, love to see love to see your message get out there and thank you for using me to help make that possible. Um, you know, you know our hearts desires and you know our needs better than we know how to ask for them, God. So please help us turn away and go and sin no more when we recognize that we're not walking upright and straight and straighten our paths and guide our feet let us seek first the kingdom of heaven and all the things that we want and need will be added to us so father we just ask that you walk with us for the rest of this day and that you help give us a deeper revelation and confirmation tonight in the devotional and the psalm so all these things we just offer up to you and we thank you so much god for being you and doing you and we just uh, we're in all that you're a loving god that even cares and wants to reveal yourself to us. So as long as we have an opportunity to draw closer to you, God, let us take full advantage of that. And so we just, um, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys, I'll see you all tonight. Have a good one.